Hello friends, in this uh, lecture we will study the cranial cavity with respect to the meninges especially concentrating on the dura mater as well as its foldings and the spaces within them. Uh, these are the specific objectives which we will try to cover. The first one is define the term meninges, describe their reflections and indicate the real as well as potential meningeal spaces. Then describe the dural venous sinuses with special emphasis on the cavernous venous sinus. So this is the cranial cavity cut inside and the brain has been removed and you can see one of the meninges and you can see the uh, all the cranial nerves here how they are uh, entering the, uh, the different parts of the body through the cranial cavity leaving the cranial cavity and entering the different parts of the body. Coming to the, uh, the meninges, the meninges is nothing but the connective tissue layer which will be covering the brain as a protective covering the brain as well as the spinal cord. Okay, so these are the meninges, these are nothing but the connective tissue coverings which cover the brain as well as the spinal cord and they protect the brain as well as the, the spinal cord. So these are called as meninges and they are in three layers from outside to inside the first one is called as the dura matter, the arconoid matter as well as the pia matter. Matter means uh, mother so they are covering and protecting the brain and the spinal cord just like a mother protects its baby so that's why it is called as matter. Dura matter, arconoid matter as well as the, the pia matter. The arconoid and pia matter are usually together adherent to each other and sometimes they are called as leptomeninges. Together they are called as leptomeninges. So whenever the term leptomeninges is mentioned then you should think of both the arconoid matter and the pia matter together. The pia matter is the most uh, innermost layer which is totally covering the, the brain and it is totally adherent to the, the cerebral cortex. So it is uh, pia matter is transparent microscopically very thin vascular membrane which follows the contour of the brain that is the uh, cerebral co cortex including the sulci, gyri, fissures everywhere it will invaginate along with the the uh, invaginations within the within uh, on the surface of the, the cerebral cortex so it will be uh, following the contour of the brain itself so it is totally adherent to the brain and it cannot be stripped okay so it cannot be stripped if you strip uh, try to strip this uh, pia matter uh, it will damage and remove some parts of the the tissue of the cerebral cortex itself so it is very difficult to strip so and uh, that's why uh, it is totally adherent as well as transparent that's why even uh, though it is covering the cerebral cortex you can see the cerebral cortex because the pia matter is transparent so here you can see, uh, appreciate when you cut the skull and deep inside you can see this is the dura matter, it is in two layers, we will see that. Then we have the arconoid matter, this one is the arconoid matter and this is the subarconoid space and the pia matter is total, this is the cerebral cortex. So it is totally adherent to the cerebral cortex and it is invaginating along with the, of the, the fissures, gyra and sulci. Okay. So it will be totally adherent. So that part which is totally adherent that will be called as the, the pia matter. So they have mentioned here the pia matter which is totally adherent to the cerebral cortex itself. So here again they have taken a part of the section of the brain and trying to show you the, the different layers. So here is the cranium and this is the dura matter the endosteal layer then there is other, another layer of dura matter that is called a meningeal layer we will see that and in between there is space that is called a dural venous sinuses and below this this is the subarachnoid space uh, the subdural space just below the dura is the subdural space between the dura as well as the arachnoid so here is the arachnoid matter and this is the subarachnoid space below the arachnoid will be the subarachnoid space and here the pia matter is totally adherent to the cerebral cortex you can see here the cerebral cortex even though uh, it is covering the cerebral cortex you can still see the cerebral cortex because the pia matter is totally transparent okay uh, begin with to begin with the dura matter uh, the dura matter is an opaque thin uh, the thick dense tough non-elastic fibrous membrane composed of the densely packed 
uh, fascicles of the collagen fibers that's why it is uh, thick as well as dense as well as opaque arranged in the form of laminae okay it incompletely divides the cranial cavity into compartments we will see later the pictures where it divides the whole of the cranial cavity into compartments but it is incomplete compartments and accommodate also uh, the dural venous sinus the spaces between the dura mater itself okay so here you can see uh, this is the cranial cavity mm, this is the uh, cranium and below that this is the the dura mater and in between the two layers of dura mater there is a space these are nothing but the dural venous sinuses so the dura is made up of as we saw there are two layers within the dura mater the outer is called as the the endosteal layer this is the outer layer this is called as the endosteal layer or it is also called as the the outer periosteal layer of the dura mater or it, uh, it is just like the periosteum which is the uh, inner periosteum of the skull so outside we have the the periosteum just beside the the bones the bones are covered by the periosteum so inside also it is covered by the the periosteal layer so this is nothing but the the outer layer of the dura mater that is the endosteal layer the second layer is the inner layer of the dura mater this is called as the meningeal layer the inner meningeal layer of the dura mater so outer we have the endosteal layer and uh, inner is the meningeal so there are two layers of the dura mater that you should remember so both are adherent to each other except at the uh, dural venous sinuses okay so they are usually both these layers will be totally adherent to each other except at some particular places where the cavities are formed and these will be filled with venous blades so that's why these are called as the dural venous sinuses and these are lined by endothelium so these cavities which are uh, spaces between the two layer of the dura mater uh, filled with venous blood so these are lined by the endothelium just like that of the vessels but they are not similar to vessels we will see how they are different so they are lined by the endothelium and filled with venous blood draining the most of the parts of the the brain itself so the inner meningeal layer of the dura is reflected inwards to form four septas okay so there is uh, as we saw there are two layers the outer periosteal layer which is totally adherent to the the skull bone itself okay the inner layer uh, it will invaginate as you can see here so it will be invaginating inside and it will be forming septas for, and they will form four septas what which uh, divide the whole of the cranial cavity partially so these are incomplete uh, divisions so they will divide the whole of the cranial cavity into compartments incomplete compartment uh, in which the subdivision of brain or lodge so within these cavities or compartments the different parts of the brain are lodged we will see how they are uh, divided and which parts will be uh, lodged in each area so the first one of this uh, uh, meningeal dura mater which is imaginary inside and forming a partition is the fox cerebri see if you can see here so one of the layer that is the meningeal layer will dip inside and in the center uh, it forms something called as the the fox cerebri if you can see here so same the dura mater the inner meningeal layer of the dura mater is invaginating downwards the either side from either side and it will form partition between the two cerebral hemispheres so this is the fox cerebri similarly there is a partition below below here down which will be separating the two cerebellar hemisphere this is called as that's why it is called a fog cerebelli because it separates the two cerebellar hemispheres incompletely and this fog cerebri uh, will separate the two uh, cerebral hemispheres the right and the left and in between will be this fog cerebri and the fog cerebelli will be separating the two cerebellar hemispheres then there is a tent like structure which is almost horizontally placed which separates the the cerebral hemispheres from the cerebellar hemispheres above will be the the cerebrum and below will, will be the cerebellum so it forms a tent for this cerebellum so that's why it is called as the tentorium cerebelli because it forms a tent okay so below this tentorium cerebelli will be the the uh, cerebellum okay then there is a small uh, one more part of this uh, meningeal dura mater which will be covering uh, the pituitary gland over the pituitary gland and it forms the diaphragmatic cella 
here will be the diaphragmatic cella this is the infantibulum and over it is the diaphragmatic cella which forms a diaphragm uh, and it separate the the uh, the pituitary gland below from that of the uh, the uh, optic chiasma above okay so this is the uh, diaphragmatic cella so these are the four layers uh, of the uh, uh, the meningeal layer of dura mater which will be forming partitions within the uh, the cranial cavity one is the fox cerebr uh, fox cerebri so this is the fox cerebri then below will be the fox cerebelli and this is the tentorium cerebelli tentorium cerebelli and here will be the diaphragmatic cella so these are the four septas which will be dividing the whole of the cranial cavity into incomplete com uh, compartments the tentorium cerebelli divides the cranial cavity into intercommunicating supratentorial as well as the infratentorial so the part above the stentorium cerebellar that will be called as the supratentorial supra means above above the tentorium so it is called supratentorial and the part below will be called as the infratentorial uh, compartment so in the supratentorial compartment as you know there will be the cerebral cortex the cerebellum itself okay and below will be the the, the uh, cerebellum above will be the cerebrum sorry if i said it uh, 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 wrongly then it will be uh, above will be the the cerebrum okay that both the uh, uh, hemispheres of the cerebrum and below will be the cerebellum so in that supratentorial compartment there will be the cerebrum and in the infratentorial compartment there will be cerebellum okay so this a tentorium cerebelli will divide the cranial cavity into an upper compartment supratentorial and lower compartment called as the infratentorial compartment the functions of these dural folds is to minimize the rotatory displacement of the brain so whenever there is a rotation or damage or any accidents taking place at that time these compartments these incomplete partitions will uh, prevent much of the rotation of the displacement of the the brain itself okay the cerebrum as well as the cerebellum so it prevents much uh, distortion as well as the displacement of the brain and it protects it okay so here you can again appreciate the fox cerebri so this is the fox cerebri and below will be the fox cerebelli small part and this is the tentorium cerebelli and here is the diaphragmatic cella <clears throat> the arachnoid matter is separated from the dura by the subdural space and is traversed by cerebral veins uh, so the the area below the uh, the um, the dura mater um, meningeal layer of the dura mater that will be called as subdural space between the dura mater and the arachnoid matter so that space is called as the the subdural space and usually it will contain cerebral veins this you should remember cerebral veins and the arachnoid is separated from the pia mater by the subarachnoid space subarachnoid space is important space a large space which is uh, filled with csf and in this mainly the arteries of the brain will be present so in the subdural space cerebral veins will be there and in the subarachnoid space arteries of the brain will be present this is important clinically because whenever there is head injuries then there might be subdural hemorrhage or uh, the subarachnoid hemorrhage if it is subdural hemorrhage it is due to the collection of the venous blood caused by the tearing of the cerebral veins as you know the cerebral uh, subdural space will be containing cerebral veins so if there is any bleeding so like here they have shown you the subdural hematoma so where it is because of the damage to the cerebral veins so whenever it is subdural hemorrhage it is because of the the tearing of the cerebral veins and if it is subarachnoid hemorrhage because the subarachnoid space will contain the the arteries of the brain it will be due to the the rupture of the arteries and their aneurysms okay so subarachnoid space is usually arterial and subdural space is usually the sub, uh, the uh, because of the the uh, tearing of the cerebral veins okay and sometimes there can be also extra dural hemorrhage uh, outside the the epidural space it's a very small space potential space there is no space at all uh, because usually uh, the cranial cavity is totally adherent to the the uh, the periosteal layer endosteal layer 
but you know, sometimes if there is any uh, damage uh, uh, trauma then there can be sometimes the extra dural hemorrhage and this is because of the tearing of the meningeal vessels usually associated with the fracture of the skull so because if there is uh, trauma from outside because of the uh, skull fracture there can be bleeding uh, from the especially from the tearing of the meningeal vessels and usually it will be extra dural hemorrhage okay so here they have shown you the extra dural hemorrhage how to differentiate between the extra dural hemorrhage and this uh, this is the subdural hemorrhage so extra dural will be uh, uh, confined to that particular bone okay but in case of the subdural it will spread much more uh, <coughs> so here you can appreciate once again so this is the the uh, the uh, the dura mater which is subosteal area okay just above that will be the uh, periosteum uh, periosteal uh, layer so this is the periosteal layer or endosteal layer so above that will be the the epidural space where there can be extra dural hemorrhages so this is the meningeal layer and below that is the subdural space small space and this is the arconoid space uh, this is the arconoid layer and this is the pia mater so between the arconoid and pia this is the sub sub arconoid space uh, filled with CSF as well as you can see also the, the blood vessels. In case of the uh, uh, the subdural space, there are veins. You can see the veins. In the subarachnoid space, there are arteries, and this is the pia mater, so which is totally adherent to the the cerebral cortex itself. So here they have reflected the the dura mater, and they are trying to show you the the cerebral veins between the uh, the so the dura mater and the arachnoid mater so here you can see these are the venous vessels which are there okay just below the uh, the dura mater that is in the subdural space <coughs> coming to the venous sinuses of the dura mater so as we saw between the two layers of the dura there can be a space so dural venous sinuses are spaces between the endosteal as well as the meningeal layer. So this is the endosteal layer and between and the this is the meningeal layer. In between, sometimes usually they are as I said, they are totally adherent, except in some areas where they are separated and there is a space formed within them. So dural venous spaces are nothing but spaces between the endosteal and meningeal layer of the dura matter except the inferior sagittal and straight sinus these are not uh, dural venous uh, exactly uh, to be specific between the the uh, the meningeal as well as the endosteal layer so these exception are the the inferior sagittal as well as the straight sinus except that all other are uh, dural venous spaces between the endosteal and the meningeal layer okay so th these are the dural uh, the, the dural venous sinuses so because they are present between the two layers of dura so they are called as the dural venous sinuses what are the characteristic of these dural venous spaces one is they are lined by endothelium whenever they are present between the two layers of the dura mater they are lined by endothelium just like the vessels but they are devoid of muscular coat they are unlike the the veins and arteries because they don't have muscular coat the arteries and the veins will have muscular coat outside okay but these don't have the muscular coat and they are also they are unlike the veins because they are valveless usually the veins will have valves but here these spaces do not have valves so these are valveless uh, venous sinuses and they also absorb csf there will be arachnoid granulation later we'll see uh, if you saw these pictures previously, maybe you can hear yeah, here you can see these are the arachnoid granulation coming from the the arachnoid subarachnoid space and these will be absorbing the the CSF. Okay, so they are, they also absorb CSF through the arachnoid granulation tissue and they collect blood from the brain managers deploy orbit as well as the internal ear. So in all, from all these regions, they will collect blood from different parts of the, the brain itself, meninges, deploy, orbit as well as the internal ear and they will drain all these parts uh, 
uh, of the venous blood. So these are some of the characteristics and they also re receive emissary veins. Emissary veins are those veins which connect the, uh, the outer part of the skull with the in inner cr cranial cavity. Okay, uh, again if you see these pictures maybe they have shown you, yeah, here you can see these are the emissary veins. Okay, so they are connecting the, uh, the outer part of the skin of the skull. Okay, skull cap with that of the, the inner part of the cranial cavity. So the infections usually which are there in the skull cap might be transferred into the, uh, to the cranial cavity. So, so these are the emissary veins. So these are some of the important characteristic features of the, the dura venous cell. One is they are lined by endothelium but they are devoid of muscular cord, they are valveless and they have the function of absorbing the CSF. They collect the venous blood from different parts of the brain and they also receive emissary veins. Okay, so here you can see, so these are one of the dural venous sinus. This is the superior sagittal sinus, okay, where there are two layers of the dura matter in between there is a space filled with venous blood. And here you can see this is the arcanoid granulations and you can see that the arcanoid granulations are invaginating into the space and they absorb the, uh, the CSF uh, into the, uh, the space dural venous sinus. Now coming to the classification of the dural venous sinuses. The dural venous sinuses are classified into two types. One is paired and the second one is unpaired. So the unpaired will be the superior sagittal sinus then the inferior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, occipital sinus, anterior intercavernous sinus, posterior intercavernous sinus and basilar venous plexus. These are the uh, seven unpaired dural venous sinuses. Coming to the paired one, they are the transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus, the cavernous sinus, the superior petrosal sinus, the inferior petrosal sinus, spinoparietal sinus, petrosquamous sinus as well as the middle meningeal sinus. So all these are the, the sinuses which will be the, uh, the sinuses which are present within the, uh, the dural space. So here you can see the different uh, sinuses here. This is the superior sagittal sinus which is in the midline and which is unpaired. This is the inferior sagittal sinus. So both these are the, the superior and inferior sagittal sinus are the unpaired sinuses. So this is the superior sagittal sinus as I said. Then this is the inferior sagittal sinus which is present within the Fox cerebri. Then we have the straight sinus, this is the third one. This is the straight sinus. Then we have the occipital sinus. It will be below. It can be seen with this section. We'll show in the other picture. So it will be below. That will be called as the occipital sinus. Then anterior intercavernous sinus. So the cavernous sinus are either on either side here. They are paired cavernous. So the two the cavernous sinuses are communicated between the two. There is a communication which is passing anterior to the the uh, infantibulum. This is called as the the anterior intercavernous sinus. Similarly, we have the posterior intercavernous sinus. So there is anterior intercavernous sinus as well as the posterior intercavernous sinus. Then the finally the basilar venous plexus, which will be below here, that will be called as the the basilar venous plexus. So basilar sinus. Okay. So then the paired sinuses are the transverse sinus. So transverse sinus, you can see this is the right transverse sinus. On the other side, we have the left transverse sinus. Then we have the sigmoid sinus. So this transverse sinus will continue in the front as the sigmoid sinus. I'll show you this picture. So this is much more better. This is seen with the cut section seen from above, removing the brain. This is the right transverse sinus. This is the left transverse sinus. Okay, then this transverse sinus contains as the sigmoid sinus as shape structure. So this is the sigmoid sinus. Okay. Then we have the, uh, the transverse and sigmoid and then the cavernous sinus we already saw. So these are the two cavernous sinus in this section as you can see. Here this is the cavernous sinus uh, within which the intercatered artery is passing. So these are the two sinuses, cavernous sinus the main, the largest and the main cavernous sinus where 
uh, all the veins in the cavernous sinuses will be draining all the uh, sinuses will be draining into the cavernous sinus okay then we have the superior petrosal sinus as well as the inferior petrosal if you can see here this uh, superior sigma, uh, sigmoid sinus will continue at the superior petrosal sinus here also you can see in this picture the sigmoid sinus is continuing at the superior petrosal sinus and below that is the inferior petrosal sinus on either side okay here you cannot see in this picture here to the below here okay that is the superior and inferior uh, petrosal sinus then the spinoparietal sinus spinoparietal sinus uh, okay here they have shown you this is the spinoparietal sinus on either side okay then we have petrosquamous sinus as well as the medial meningeal sinus all these are the sinuses which will be present within the cranial cavity okay now coming to the most important sinus among all the sinus that is the the cavernous sinus so these are the paired sinuses situated on either side of the body of the sphenoid bone okay so here you can see in this picture this is the the cavernous sinus on either side and these are the sphenoid and air sinus and this is the sphenoid bone so within the body of the same beside the body of the uh, sphenoid sinus you can see the cavernous sinus and within the body of the spinoid sinus, you can see this is the spinoidal air sinus. You should be able to differentiate the air sinuses from the uh, dural venous sinuses. Okay, so these are the air sinuses. Okay, yeah, this is the spinoidal air sinus, and here is the cavernous venous sinuses. Okay, so these are the paired uh, sinuses situated on either side of the the spinoid bone. Okay and extend from the superior orbital fissure so it extends from the superior orbital fissure in the front uh, uh, front to the apex of the petrosal uh, petrous temporal bone behind okay so in this picture you can appreciate okay this is the spinodal uh, the cavernous sinus so anteriorly here this is the superior uh, 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 superior orbital fissure sorry so superior orbital fissure will be here okay through which uh, the uh, all the contents of the cavity of the uh, uh, of the anticranial cavity will communicate with that of the the cavity of the orbit okay so here the structures will pass either they will be entering or coming out okay here is the superior orbital fissure so it extends from the superior orbital fissure in the front to behind to the the body of the the spinoid bone itself uh, it was part of the temporal bone the measurement almost the length is uh, two centimeters in length and breadth is almost one centimeter the length is much more so you can see in this picture the length is two centimeter and the breadth is almost one centimeter uh, the structures passing are the most important there are very important structures in relation to the cavernous sinus one is the as i said the internal carotid artery which is passing through this cavernous sinus so sometimes there can be a rupture of the the intercarotid artery into this cavernous. So what happens? We will discuss later. So one of the very important structure passing through is the intercarotid artery and very important cranial nerves are passing through it. One is the the abducens nerve itself. So the abducens nerve has been shown here just below the the intercarotid artery. This is the sixth cranial nerve. Then we have the the third cranial nerve that is the acromolar nerve. Then the two divisions of the trigeminal nerve that is the ophthalmic as well as the maxillary division ophthalmic as well as the maxillary division not the the mandibular division doesn't pass through here but the ophthalmic as well as maxillary division will be passing through this as well as even the uh, the fourth that is the trochlear nerve also passes through near the cavernous sinus so there are very important cranial nerves passing uh, uh, beside the cavernous sinus in very in uh, in complete contact and relation with the cavernous sinus as well as the internal carotid artery is also passing and in the center if you see this is the pituitary gland this is the pituitary gland in the separating the two cavernous sinus and superiorly we can see the optic chiasma so this is the infantibulum and here the optic chiasma so very important relation above we have the the optic chiasma as well as the pituitary gland infantibulum and below we have the the spinodal air sinus and within them with the, the intercarotid artery the third uh, cranial nerve the fourth cranial nerve the sixth cranial and the two parts of the fifth cranial nerve that is the ophthalmic and maxillary divisions 
Coming to the relations, as I said already, um, gave you the relations medially and below we have the hypophysis cerebri that is the pituitary gland as well as the spinoidal ear sinus. Laterally, we have the K1 trigeminal on either side, K1 trigeminal as well as the, the uncus of the temporal bone. What you are seeing here is this is the uncus of the temporal bone. Then above we have the optic asthma as we can see as well as the, the internal carotid artery okay sometimes it will be above in some parts and sometimes it is passing deep to the the uh, the carotid uh, the uh, the cavernous sinus itself coming to the tributaries what are the main tributaries which are draining into this cavernous sinus one is the superior ophthalmic vein then the the branch of the inferior ophthalmic vein the central vein of the retina most of the veins of the uh, eye and the eyeball will be draining into this as well as the super superficial middle cerebral vein then we have the inferior cerebral vein the spinoparietal sinus anterior trunk of the middle meningeal vein sometimes will be all uh, draining into this cavernous sinus this is the cavernous sinus here shown on either side this is the pituitary gland here is the spinoidal ear sinus this is the intercatter artery and all the cranial nerves important cranial nerves which are shown what, what is the communication of this cavernous sinus? It will be communicating with the transverse sinus through the uh, superior petrosal sinus you already saw. Then with the internal jugular vein through the inferior petrosal sinus and the, the plexus of veins around the internal catheter artery also will be communicating with the, uh, the cavernous sinus. Then the, with the pterygoid venous plexus through the emissary veins, pterygoid venous plexus is the plexus of vein which will be communicating again with the the cavernous sinus then the facial vein itself by the superior ophthalmic vein as well as the angular vein uh, into the trigoid venous plexus and also the deep facial vein all this will be draining into the uh, or opening or communicating with the cavernous sinus so any infections especially in the danger area of the face that is the lower part of the nose as well as the upper lip so any infection there can be directly drained from the infection can be carried from that part through the superior ophthalmic vein or through the angular vein into the trigoid venous plexus and from there into the uh, the cavernous sinus itself okay, or the deep facial vein drain, directly draining into the cavernous sinus so easily the infections outside can carry it into the cranial cavity with the opposite cavernous sinus as you saw the two cavernous sinus are communicating with each other through the anti and posterior intercavernous sinus with the superior sagittal sinus through the superficial middle cerebral veins as well as the superior anastomatic vein okay so these are some of the communications okay the important part is note uh, the uh, septic thrombosis of the cavernous sinus may be caused by the numerous communication from the dangerous area of the face or the orbit so any infections outside in the orbit or on the danger area of the face can be carried into the uh, the cavernous sinus and that might lead to septic thrombosis the internal cataracts sometimes as i said uh, there is a very important relation of the internal cataract passing through the cavernous sinus sometimes it might rupture into the cavernous sinus leading to arteriovenous communication where the artery and venous blood will be communicating with each other and it leads to a very clinical manifestation by the pulse uh, pulsating exophthalmus and loud systolic murmur over the temporal region and you can see the eyeball popping up every time with every second with the heart beating of the heart so that is called as pulsating exophthalmus pulsating exophthalmus where the eyeball will protrude out and goes in protrude out and goes in with every uh, uh, beat of the heart okay and also you can hear the loud systemic murmur systolic murmur over the temporal region okay so these are the some of the communication here you can see the picture showing the ophthalmic veins draining into the cavernous sinus there is communication between the cavernous sinus on either side by the anti and posterior intercomer uh, cavernous sinus and pterygoid venous plexus is here which will be again communicating into the cavernous sinus as well as you can also see the um, the basilar sinus also communicating with the the uh, this cavernous sinus and all this communication through the superior petrosal sinus, the inferior petrosal sinus, all will be communicating with the cavernous sinus. Now coming to the, the blood supply. 
blood supply of the meninges uh, by the anteacranial fossa by the anterior meningeal artery okay so here you can see the anterior meningeal artery shown then the middle cranial fossa but the middle meningeal artery very important artery this is the middle meningeal artery as well as the accessory meningeal branch of the maxillary artery then the posterior cranial fossa by the posterior meningeal artery here you can see the posterior meningeal uh, branch of the vertebral artery okay so the vertebral artery and ascending pharyngeal arteries so all these arteries will be supplying the different parts of the meninges anterior cranial fossa middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa anterior cranial fossa by the anterior meningeal arteries middle cranial fossa by the middle meningeal and the accessory meningeal branches of the maxillary artery and the meninges in the posterior cranial fossa by the posterior meningeal branches of the vertebral as well as ascending pharyngeal arteries the meningeal arteries supply mainly the bone than the dura mater so even though these are called as meningeal arteries because in they are in uh, uh, clear communication with that of the meninges but they are mainly supplying the bone than the uh, the dura mater the, or the meninges or the dura mater to be specific okay so the main supply is the bone of the cranial cavity than the dura mater uh, or the uh, the meninges itself the meningeal veins are more closer to the bone than the artery this is a very important clinical again importance so the meningeal veins as you saw they are present in the the subdural space meningeal veins but the meningeal arteries are present in the the subarachnoid space so meningeal veins are more closer to the bone than the arteries itself they are extradural in position and they grew the bone they also grew the bone so the growing if you see when you uh, take the skull cap uh, uh, the the cranium itself and see from inside the growing of the arteries this is because of the vein meningeal vein than the meningeal arteries okay so here you can see the anterior meningeal artery this is the middle meningeal artery a very important relation near the uh, arterion where the four bones meet and this is where you can easily approach the middle meningeal artery and posteriorly we have the posterior meningeal artery coming to the nerve supply the innervation of the dura mater is by small meningeal branches of all the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve okay here the trigeminal nerve that is the third of the fifth cranial nerve which will have three divisions that's what is called a trigeminal the ophthalmic maxillary and mag uh, mandibular division so you can see here this is the ophthalmic the part which is shown with the green color so all that parts will be supplied by the or uh, supplied by the the ophthalmic division or trigeminal nerve okay so this whole fox cerebri this is the fox cerebri the tentorium cerebelli okay the fox cerebelli will be below this is the tentorium cerebelli and here you can see the diaphragmatic cella and all these regions uh, will be supplied by the the ophthalmic division shown in green color the then we have the the maxillary division will be supplying those area which are shown in brown color here then here are the green colored which are shown, supplied by the the mandibular division so all the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve will be supplying the dura mater as well as the first second and third cervical nerves also supplying this uh, violet colored regions are supplied by the, the cervical nerves the first second and third cervical nerves also the vagus nerve will be supplying so uh, to be uh, more precise the anterior cranial fossa by the meningeal branches from the ethmoid nerve which are from the ophthalmic nerve the middle cranial fossa by the middle branches the meningeal branches from the maxillary nerve and laterally by the mandibular nerve and the posterior cranial fossa will be by the first, second, and third cervical nerves. This is how the division of the whole of the cranial cavity, or the meninges of the cranial cavity, will be supplied by the uh, the nerves. The base is supplied by the vagus nerve. Okay. So this is how again it has been shown here. So this whole thing, which is in green color, will be supplied by the ophthalmic division, ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve so this brown area will be supplied by the maxillary division and this color bluish to be specific with this is supplied by the mandibular division and this violet color is a region will be supplied by the cervical nerves and the base will be supplied by the vagus nerve coming to the last aspect that is the applied aspects 
uh, we saw that there can be hemorrhages because of the rupture of the arteries or the veins that the, the especially the extradural hemorrhages are because of the the tearing of the veins okay and they will be more specific to the bone because they are extradural outside the dura mater that is uh, superficial to the the periosteal layer or the extradural layer so they are confined to that particular bone and so that's why they take the shape of the the bone itself so that is how you can differentiate the extradural hemorrhages from the subdural hemorrhages which are subdural hemorrhages are much broader because they are below the dura matter between the dura and the arachnoid matter in the subdural space okay so these are the the subdural uh, hemorrhages and the emissary veins transmit external infections uh, intracranially as we saw the emissary veins are those veins which are communicating outside with the internal cranial cavity so the cranial cavity can get uh, get infected easily by the infections outside and especially the meningitis is a common uh, infection seen uh, in case of the humans and it can be bacterial or more common it is tubercular infections okay okay so that is the meningitis so this the uh, the applied aspect now coming to the the difference between the dural and the spinal dura so uh, there are difference between the the dura covering the the brain itself with that of the spinal cord how they are different the meningeal layer of the cranial dura forms inward process or fold but uh, such folds are lacking in the spinal dura one is the meningeal layer of the cranial dura forms inward folds processes folds but such folds are lacking in the spinal dura there are no folds within the the meningeal layer of the cranial dura in case of the, the spinal cord so here they have shown the the dura covering the the brain itself and here is the spinal cord so the there are two layers right so the meningeal layer the inner layer of the dura which is in the cranial cavity shows folds inward folds but that is not seen in case of the the spinal dura the second important feature and very important feature is the cranial dura has two layers as you saw endosteal and the meningeal layer but these two layers are present only in the the in the uh, cranial cavity once it enters the cranial uh, the um, spinal cord the uh, the outer layer that is the endosteal layer of the dura because it is endosteal it is covering only the bone so it will continue and continue outside at the periosteum of the skull so it doesn't continue below so in case of the spinal cord there is only one layer of the dura that is the meningeal layer so in uh, uh, but the spinal dura has only the meningeal layer because the spinal meningeal layer will be continuing and cover the whole of the spinal cord but the endosteal layer because it should cover only the bone so it will uh, continue as the periosteum of the the cranial uh, fossa okay outside it covers the the bones of the cranium okay as periosteum so in case of the uh, spinal cord there is only one layer of the that is the meningeal layer of the dura mater and the dural venous sinuses are found because there are no two layers so there cannot be uh, the dural venous sinuses in the spinal cord because for dural venous space, space to be present it should be the endosteal layer and the meningeal layer but here because there is only one layer so the dural venous sinuses are found only in the cranial dura along with the lines of the separation between the endosteal and meningeal layer and they are absent in the uh, the spinal cord and the extra dural or the epidural space is present within the vertebral column but not in the cranial fossa as you saw in the cranial fossa the extra dural space is just a potential space a very small space or the epidural space is a very small space but it is much more prominent in case of this the spinal cord see here you can see here the spinal extra dural space it is large and lot of injections uh, the anesthesia are given in this region so this is important space in case of the spinal cord where, where the extra dural space or the epidural space is prominent and it is just a potential space or absent in case of the the cranial dura so here you can see the dura matter which has been cut here and so that you can see the the arachnoid matter okay so this is the uh, the dura that is the meningeal dura and this is the arachnoid matter 
and due to that will be the pia mater which is totally adherent to the again to the the spinal cord itself now coming to the the second layer after the dura mater now we will talk about the arachnoid mater in brief um, arachnis as it means it is means spider so it looks like a spider that's what is called as the if you see the picture so here this is the dura mater the meningeal layer and arachnoid mater this is the arachnoid mater and it will be giving spine like spider like spreading of the arachnoid mater so that's what is called a spider it is called so because of the numerous spider like trabeculae extending between the arachnoid and the pia mater which will connect the arachnoid and the pia mater here is the pia mater this is the the cerebral cortex but the pia mater is totally adherent to the the cerebral cortex so there is communication between the arachnoid and pia mater through this uh, uh, spread of uh, spider like structure so that's why it is called as uh, the the arachnoid mater and because the arachnoid and pia mater are communicating with each other and they are together so they are sometimes called as called as leptomeninges as i said before so arachnoid mater is separated from the dura by the subdural space filled with capillary layer of the tissue fluid and gives passage for the cerebral veins as we saw the arachnoid mater and the dura mater between them there is a very small space filled with tissue fluid and that space is for the the passage of the cerebral veins the arachnoid mater is adherent to the dura mater because of the hydraulic traction by film of fluid so the arachnoid mater is adherent to the dura mater it is together because of the the tissue fluid and the hydraulic traction formed by this fluid okay it is closely attached to the dura but separated from the pia by the subarachnoid space even though we said the arachnoid and the pia mater are connected to each other there is a large space here okay this is called as the subarachnoid space and this is filled with the csf cerebrospinal fluid and it varies greatly in depth and larger expanses being termed as subarachnoid systems and there is this is a space big space filled with csf uh, fluid uh, but uh, there are some areas where it is very large and there it is called a system subarachnoid systems okay and the pia mater as we said it will be totally adherent to the 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 cerebral cortex itself okay so this is the subarachnoid space there is the arachnoid mater and here is the the pia mater okay and this is the communication between the arachnoid and pia mater and within the subarachnoid space it is filled with csf as well as you can see the the arteries within them the cerebral arteries will be present in this subarachnoid space now the three system systems as we said are the larger spaces where the arachnoid and the pia mater are um, uh, Uh, these are the systems where there is a big large space between this arachnoid and the pia mater so there are three important systems lie ventral to the brain stem and the hypothalamus between the the brain stem and the hypothalamus there are large systems which are those one is called as the pontine system pontine system here you can see uh, between the pons and the medulla oblongata there is a large space ventral to them so this is called as pontine system then there is also called as the interpeduncular system just be below the optic chiasma there is a large space okay and this is called as the interpeduncular system and this is a chiasmatic system also near the chiasma itself there is one more large system that is called as the chiasmatic system okay so these are the three large spaces between the arachnoid and pia mater which are called a system so these are ventrally placed and there are two dorsal systems okay two systems lie dorsal to the brain stem okay which is one is called as the cerebromedullar system a very important system here uh, this is called as the cerebromedullar system see near the cp angle okay so this is the uh, the cerebromedullar system then there is also one more system called as the superior system which cannot be again seen with this so these are the you know, five systems which are present three in the ventral side and two on the dorsal side now the last part that is the deepest layer that is the pia mater okay as we know it is thin vascular which invests every indent of the surface of the brain and the spinal cord as we said the it is totally adherent to the brain itself so it will be indenting every uh, dip and depression along with that of the the cerebral cortex itself so this is the pia mater here this is the subarachnoid space and here is the arachnoid mater 
and a part of the arachnoid matter will be invaginating into dural sinus called as the arachnoid granulation through which the CF, uh, CSF is absorbed into the systems. Um, this pia matter has two layers, outer epipia and the inner pia intima, very thin layer itself and it, is, it has again it uh, has two layers epipia and the uh, the inner pia intima okay the cerebral pia presents tila cord a and choroid plexus so these are the tila choroid a and the choroid plexus these are the plexus which will be producing the csf within the the ventricles okay so these tila choroid a are coming uh, are the blood vessels which are covered by the the pia itself the cerebral pia present tila choroid a and choroid plexus um, within which there will be plexus of uh, blood vessels through which the CSF is produced into the ventricles. The tila choroidae is bilaminar fold of the pia mater and seen in two locations, especially the roof of the third and the fourth ventricle, where the choroid plexus are present. There, the tila choroidae is bilaminar, it is two layer fold of pia mater and seen in two locations in the roof of the third and the fourth ventricle, where the choroid plexus will be, uh, be covered by this tila choroidae. The tila uh, provides vascular tuft of choroid plexus as I said, there will be tuft of choroid plexus covered by the tila choroidae, uh, tila um, choroidae which projects into the ventricles producing the CSF as I said before. So they will be inv uh, invaginating into the, the, uh, the third and the fourth ventricle especially in the roof of the third and the fourth ventricle and they will be producing the CSF. Okay, so this is about the, the pyamata itself. Okay, so here you can see these are the, the, the choroid plexus covered by the tila choroidae. This is the third ventricle, roof of the third ventricle and the, the roof of the fourth ventricle where the choroid plexus covered by the tila choroidae where the CSF is produced and this will be passing through different parts and passes through the, uh, the, mm, the venous sinus itself. Okay. <coughs> so, so these are the regions through which the CSF is passing and then it will be draining through the choroid, uh, arachnoid granulations into the, the, uh, the dural venous sinuses. Okay, so this is the production and this is the drainage of the, the CSF itself. So this is all about the, the meninges of the brain, especially concentrating on the dura matter as well as the dural venous sinuses. If you have any questions, you can write to me and I will try to answer. Thank you very much. Hi friends, if you like my video and if you want to see similar kind of videos in the future, subscribe to my channel as well as like the video, press the bell icon so that you can get regular updates and you will be the first to get the updates. Then you can also comment as well as share this video with all your friends so that all can benefit from this. Thank you very much.